Hello, uh, my name is Griffith Fries, and I'm a postdoc at the Alan Turing Institute. And this is a presentation on uh, how I converted a research project to my first PyPy release and uh, all of my uh, mishaps in doing so, which I hope are things people might find useful. Uh, so, hello. Uh, I uh, just a bit about me. I was taught C in high school, uh, but swore off programming. I crawled back in as a master's student uh, on the project, uh, which eventually became my PhD in sociology on uh, how a community called FidoNet changed geographically over time. And the GeoJenga project was absolutely crucial for that. Uh, I am now very privileged to be a postdoc at the Alan Turing Institute, but I also moonlight as an artist in theater, film, uh, jazz jams, and photos, uh, particularly of late, like this one. So uh, goals of this project, uh, presentation, uh, pros and cons of rearranging a project for public release, cookie cutter templates and how they can help, not just for Python, but other projects, options for testing uh, across standard libs uh, and PyTest, et cetera, um, the uh, continuous integration options uh, like Travis and GitHub Actions, documentation like Sphinx, read the docs, deployments on PyPy, releasing on Zenodo and not getting that confused with Zotero as I have many times. Uh, anyone who knows them both can hopefully see why, not just the sound. Uh, so I'm gonna start the clock because uh, I don't have two screens uh, and I messed up ordering an adapter for one. So rearranging a project for public release. Uh, so this came out of uh, work I was originally as an RA on, uh, on querying the company's house and charities commission in the UK for networks of board members attached to companies and charities. Um, it's not the point of the talk, but uh, those uh, network structures, uh, technically known as bipartite or bimodal networks, um, are uh, a research interest um, that made a lot of use of the Network X library. Um, so that was one of my crucial dependencies uh, in my requirements.txt. And when I rejoined the project a year and a half later, excuse me, um, I just foolishly reinstalled all the packages without keeping track of their versions. Excuse me. So uh, that was a terrible decision. Um, the Network X migration guide kindly keeps uh, an update of how difficult it would be to reconstruct a pickle file. And I had foolishly had a whole bunch of pickle files wrapped around attributes to classes, et cetera, et cetera. It was a terrible rabbit hole. I didn't know what to do. I still have an awful old PyC file to remind myself not to pickle like that ever again. And refactoring for me was pretty much required. So that was my initial bias. Uh, but I also was quite excited about the prospect of doing something that was open source. Open source software is really how I learned to code because my memories of high school, I mean, maybe some of that was kind of underneath and helped me get going, but that's what got me excited about it, uh, particularly Django. Um, unit testing, I really like unit testing, but the prospect for other people to use it, like my colleague, but other, you know, future collaboration and this warm glow feeling, which I like from that particular publication. Uh, so the current state, the package is called UK Boards. It's very alpha, the command line interface is, well, utter mess, it's all my fault. Anyway, it's lots to still fix, but uh, it's partly how I managed to get this postdoc. Uh, we got two papers under review from stuff we've queried through that. Colleagues have approached for further collaboration. I feel much more competent as a programmer and I was really excited when I finally had a DOI from Zenodo and I, it's, it's much easier to maintain and install for new projects than certainly what I started with. So. Here's just a little flavor of what came out of that project. Um, those are companies that share board members. Um, so hence their links on that geographic network. So cons of taking it to PyPy take a huge amount of effort, especially the first time it may expose bad shortcuts that you had uh, early in the project. Uh, you may need to be really more rigorous about quality and maintenance of your work. Uh, you might need to separate code out from paper that's about to be uh, you know, under review and your colleagues may not initially understand uh, maybe in the social sciences, this is more of an issue than the hard ones. Um, but the advantage is, is that it can be really helpful uh, and it can be much easier to maintain, easier to reproduce results, easier to add features to, and more directly citable, uh, perhaps in its own right or attached to a, a paper. I kind of cheated and did that at a conference, but I certainly still feel that warm glow and it's nice to have something direct to refer to in an academic context. So how do you start? Basics that you need, you need to make sure that you've got something to work with. Um, Git repository or uh, 
Mercurial still maintained, I think, is, is at least an option, but it's probably going to have to be a shift to Git for all of these other features out there with GitHub, um, at least to start out with and due to ease. Uh, package folder structure, just make sure you got some, uh, at least a module with an init. Realize that may be really obvious, but if you're using, I don't know, uh, Jupyter or IPython a lot and weren't bothering with, uh, you know, importing from package, it's it's just some basics you got to get get used to. Um, if you're using data in your package, import lib is going to be crucial. That's going to come up a lot. Uh, dependencies. So you need to specify your actual dependencies. Having a virtual env or a, a poetry env, all of these things to keep track of what you actually need in the correct versions. You'll need a list of your your co-authors, your authors, your collaborators. What's open source license you want to use. And some sort of README and a um, you know a format that you can stick with, whether it's restructured or Markdown, uh, etc. So the data specifically is the data that you've been using and like to include in the package. Is there any questions of it being sensitive? Does some of it need to stay away prior to publishing a paper that's under review? Is the data collection of project worth citing separately? Um, and is there data in the Git repo that's just massive and you really should have it small so it's easier to maintain? Um, stuff like flat flies, those are easy to maintain or trying to minimize that. So you're just querying stuff from the public API, though that might change your time if it's your test basis, so pros and cons on that. It's more tricky for me, at least, where things like SQL dumps, uh, I got in a bit of a rabbit hole in versions of PostGIS prior to three and kind of dumping and then re-importing Pickle, I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, I had a project involving LiDAR with proprietary software. I have no idea how I would try and deal with something like that if I was going to release a library. Um, so how to include and import, uh, you know, keep it small, easier to maintain. Minimize essentials just for running tests uh, and then flag tests that require more or really slow. Uh, again, using import lib, it's just you can backport it. Uh, I, I wish I'd done that. My cheat was to just have a little Python module with lots of comments I could import, uh, but that's probably makes it a lot harder for anyone else to use. So um, if your project's already a Git repo, it's worth double checking your Git ignore. Uh, be strategic in adding only what you need as a public library. Uh, again, stuff with the academic paper keeping separate can be complicated. It's just worth flagging that repeatedly. Uh, so. That's all the academic stuff, but authentication can also be scary, you know, whatever the project. Uh, if you've accidentally got usernames, passwords, et cetera, uh, you really should use something like a .env file. There's a nice library for that. There are libraries out there that are trying to kind of uh, keep track and prevent you from adding more keys, et cetera. I'm no expert on that. I was trying to look that up. Uh, and also just should be obvious, but if you just deleted something that you haven't actually purged it from your GitHub history, your Git history, then you'll need some tools for that. Uh, I just started over from my computer. So example.env, which shouldn't be in a Git, uh, you can make nice references to stuff that's been defined prior. If you can view, include the command line interface, then you can just set these by command line and then maybe use some uh, password management systems alongside if you're going across multiple servers or whatever. Uh, but it's also worth going down the hole with colleagues and making sure their contributions are credited, ensure they're comfortable with what's included and, you know, include their commits if they actually, you know, were writing code, you know, stuff like their ORCID number, all of these are helpful for, you know, giving credit where credit is due and, but also double checking the password sensitive data in the Git repo. So if you have a structure like this, uh, that's a, a really good starting point. Um, but a lot of this can be kind of provided by a cookie cutter anyway, but vaguely having versions of elements of this is, is a really helpful starting point if you can. Um, so uh, other things worth remembering, relative imports rather than absolute imports, same thing with data files. Uh, easy if it's you know just really simple to start out with. Same thing with formatting, right? So I decided to go for public release. Uh, had some basic tests to work with. Um, and uh, so here we go for the templates. So uh, that whole concept, as far as I understand, was uh, the genius of Audrey Feldroy Greenfeld. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Very sorry if I haven't. Um, so it's a whole Python, not just Python, just code project structure template. It might not even have to be code. 
It's a shell script with config options, names, emails, all of the different you know, basics you'd need to cover all of the boilerplate that a project would need to get started and then be able to deploy and include a whole bunch of crucial things like documentation and tests. Uh, there's a whole bunch of those out there for more specific things like a Django project. Um, and many don't include virtually in V, but you know that that some do. And there's there's lots of options out there. Um, good start from scratch. It'd be pretty cool if you manage. Uh, you can learn a lot, like Linux from scratch. If you've ever tried that, um, but it can take a lot of work. Uh, it may be hard to estimate how long. Uh, it could be hard to maintain consistently across docs and code for other potential collaborators, um, and that would have been too hard for me. Poetry is another nice thing to be considered. It does actually generate a very simple default, uh, specific, specifically for PyTest. Flit can also help with deploying and a bit of managing. Pippi and V can also be helpful for managing applications, but it's specifically not designed for libraries. It uh, doesn't provide any PyPy deploy ease. Um, Py Scaffold is a project I came across very recently. Uh, it seems to be very mature and quite well suited to some of this, but I, I didn't have enough chance to try that out properly, but worth looking up. And it has very recently uh, switched to pyproject.toml, so it might be worth looking into. Um, so installing cookie cutter, like many Python packages, uh, but meant for command line work. Uh, you've got a couple of different options. Pipex is kind of a cool one. Uh, if you want to go for Conda, you just need Conda Forge. Uh, obviously, you know, different operating systems have some others. Uh, I just go for the cookie cutters from direct Git repos rather than kind of a local copy. I like to get the latest that's hopefully also tested. You can have shortcuts for different Git repositories, GitLab, Bucket, and GitHub. Uh, you can even go for specific commits or zips. Uh, test the questions from the cookie cutter you're interested in before you make your final decision. So like stuff like your package name, you want to make sure that's actually available on PyPy. Uh, so I end up kind of doing a couple of test form filling in before I kind of go for the final one. Um, search for package names to help. I ended up renaming my package after I had issues trying to collaborate with it via R and a package called Reticulate. So I had to get rid of that hyphen. Simon Willison's, one of his many genius projects was a cookie cutter for fixing a project. Thank you, Simon. Um, and it's, like I said, worth planning out how you want to answer the question. So an example with the original of it all. So it defaults to options like choosing between unit tests and PyTest, but I think you have to stick with Travis. You've got you know, different open source license options, talks for, uh, you know, which ranges of Python you want to cover, flaking coverage by default, uh, Sphinx documentation via read the docs, and choose bump to version for managing increasing versions. Um, nice little options include PyUp for managing other dependencies, whether you want to include a command line like click or arg parse by default, stuff like black, which can help with formatting. So this is the kind of setup that'll come out of something like that. Note, it doesn't actually include the requirements or test requirements that you specify. Those are just requirements.txt and requirements dev, but it fills in this form in a lot of ways that makes the whole deploy process a lot easier. Uh, but like I said, it's not synced with requirements. It requires a GitHub username. So really only works initially on GitHub, but you could probably convert it to another one specifically for Travis.yaml, doesn't include any new stuff I like, like MyPy or preconfig, and there's no option for Zenodo. Uh, some of the documentation links are a bit out, and I probably should try to help out with that. So here's a way of demonstrating how that works. So uh, all of my test versions of this. Uh, so I tend to write yes to make sure I've got the latest version. Uh, I'm just going to be quick on this uh, light variation so you can see how this changes. Um, just taking the defaults as a demonstration at the moment. Um, note that my PyPy username ends up being based on uh, what I put down for GitHub. There's a lots of ways in which these customizations play out. Uh, yes, I'll use PyTest. Yes, I'll use Black. Uh, yes, I'll use PyPy badge and I'll go for click this time. Uh, yes, an author file which helps me cite what my colleagues have done. So that just creates that folder. And then, for example, if you look at 
uh, set up that high again, you'll see something very similar uh, to what I said before, but now the requirements and test requirements are at least filled in with some of the basics. So it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty nifty way to get started. Um, right, so get out of that, go back up here, keep going. Here's that same structure if you want to kind of scroll through and look at the details. Here's another one specifically for academic stuff. Uh, this is out of a research group in the Netherlands, uh, the eScience Center. Um, they have these whole uh, fancy next steps things that'll create tickets uh, uh, within a Git repository, GitHub specifically, very academically focused, uh, asks for a whole bunch of extra things. I'll show that in the demonstration. And it specifies a citation.cff format for helping with citation. Um, uh, it's a very helpful thing in an academic context. Uh, as for the project itself, I found some of the configuration a little bit complicated. The fact that it's PI project plus setup.py plus setup.config. Uh, setup.config seems to have the majority of the options. Maybe they're hoping to simplify that at some point. Uh, this is just some of the details of how setup.config works um, and the manifest. In, um, only PyTest uh, is an option. They've got some nice extra plugins uh, for uh, kind of maintaining the code quality, but no MyPy, no pre-commit. So just to give you another little demo here. Um, so try to be a little bit quicker this time. Uh, yeah, that makes more sense. So again, it's a form to fill in. Just do the defaults for the moment. Uh, fun, this is what would be keywords in a research paper that might come out of this. Uh, code, all caps, version. Uh, your university, for example, might be worth putting down there. Full name, email, copyright holder. So it might be the university that you work for. This is it's kind of academic code of conduct stuff. All of these things uh, are, again, very academic specific, uh, and that can be quite useful. Uh, and just to kind of demonstrate where all of the, the majority of the configuration stuff comes out is down in this. Uh, so this is where that dev thing I mentioned in the uh, previous slide is. So anyway, got to keep going, don't have enough time. And have a look there. So the last one I looked at was really fancy, uh, kind of the newest and the coolest. Um, bunch of libs to include uh, uses poetry. Uh, it's just not academically focused. That's why uh, I wanted to provide that contrast. So cookie cutter, um, they suggest using that specific checkout and documentation, but probably get away without doing that. It's up to you. Again, lots of defaults. Uh, you can have a friendly name with a space. Um, author, email, again, all of these expect uh, GitHub. Um, slightly fewer license options. I really appreciate the de development stages option there. I think that's really helpful to be upfront about. Um, and then just by contrast, uh, it's all in the pyproject.toml. So all of that gets filled in here very extensive list of actually what's happening in terms of dependencies, etc. Anyway, so that's the last of our options for today. Uh, again, can have a look. Knox file is another option. Uh, I looked at quite a few other ones. Uh, here's another research, uh, no, general purpose. Uh, makes some other options like make docs rather than uh, Sphinx, uh, but also uses pre-commit, I'm a fan. Uh, here's a, another science specific one. Uh, there's an interesting lightning talk about it actually. Uh, and there's a recent fork of that that actually supports GitLab. That's the only GitLab one I've found so far. Uh, that's not quite sure. I've seen some ones, some on GitLab and not as like academically focused. Uh, there's some other kind of interesting new stuff. Again, Simon Wilson's uh, innovation plays out in some potential ways of generating uh, templates using a uh, cookie cutter, but as a one click on GitHub, kind of fascinating, inspired by this. Uh, guessing there's probably more of those to come. Those are quite recent. Uh, here are some other ones I came across, but didn't have specific configurations for deploying to PyPy. The government one was interestingly concerned very much about security. So um, 
the you know the basics are the motivation for cookie cutter uh, pie package here you know here is three options that I covered hopefully those links will help you make use of whichever one you find useful so whatever you do you're going to need some virtual env environment to be able to kind of run and test this stuff out and make that reproducible for uh, others um, so you know here are the different options creating that virtual env slightly fancier conda or poetry PPMV options all for local uh, areas for testing installs. And then you should probably have a Git repository sorted out. Um, having it matched to the project uh, slug, for example, so that you know these package names resemble what's the you know source control management name and using main rather than uh, master, by the way, for your uh, branch. So PyUp is something I'm going to come into later, uh, but it can be uh, unfortunately not used with PyProject at the moment, uh, but it can be used. Uh, uh, but uh, GitHub Dependabot can be used with PyProject.com. Um, just to recap, testing. So have you written tests before? Uh, they're really helpful. Uh, so uh, I write loads of them, probably not enough. Um, so here are the basic unit tests come with Python. The basic class structure involves a setup and a teardown to kind of rearrange so that you can kind of automate the similarities between a bunch of tests within the same class. Um, it can be a little bit clunky, but I like how clear it is. Uh, so uh, this is an example from an early version prior to uh, refactoring that you need this basic name main thing to kind of help with executing these together. There are other ways to kind of ease that. Um, basics of coverage, how many lines of your code are actually tested, uh, the speed at which the tests are run. So I'm taking a long time is worth kind of decorating them to indicate what's quick and what's slow. Um, that can help you filter out when you want to run them. And if you actually have errors in your tests, they can take a huge amount of time and seem like a waste and can be a bit of a heartache, but I think it's still worth it. Um, note, this is a way of, of skipping. You can have skip if conditionally on ways of kind of filtering the tests. PyTest is also incredibly popular. Uh, it means that you don't have to have these complicated different types of assert statements. You can just use a, a start statement. Um, you don't have to put it in classes. You can just have functions, copious plugins, uh, ease of writing fixtures. Once I figured it out, I was really confused initially, but this organizations then can just be passed as a parameter to a test function and just automatically reconstructs that. Um, and then you just assert at the end. Uh, note that's just a function rather than a class. I was really confused by a variety of in elements of initially, and it was conf test and scoping that finally kind of clued me into how this works. And this is just an example of one I created so that I would not run tests when I couldn't uh, based on my IP address. Uh, this is a, another thing I did with uh, a way of replicating API queries uh, in a test. Don't have time to go into detail, sorry. So there are many plugins. These are just a few. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to keep going. I quite like some of those extra kind of sugar elements. Tox is a way of automating running these across different versions of Python and a whole bunch of other things to check. Uh, there's some competitors to it, uh, but uh, all of those things together are being able to maintain and be happy with what uh, modifications you've made to a project. Uh, and then I think those are basically the basis on continuous integration. So uh, this is a way of basically automating doing all of that every time a change is made. Uh, through uh, changes at the GitHub uh, or you know potentially GitLab, definitely GitLab is an option uh, repository. So uh, if you register with PyUp, for example, or GitHub Dependabot, those are things that will help uh, keep track of changes to uh, dependencies uh, and help kind of it's a great way of kind of automating a whole bunch of things to make sure your your code is good. Travis is one of the old the kind of older, uh, historically more popular ones, uh, and has been a default for a lot of the cookie cutters, but they're kind of increasingly shifting towards GitHub. Some of that will come up later. So this is what comes out of a kind of standard configuration, uh, and it'll include this deploy thing to help with getting things up to PyPy. We'll cover that a bit later. Um, to actually kind of sort out the configuration for Travis, um, initially it seemed like you have to do it by the command line via Ruby in their little library. 
I'll cover some other options for that later. GitHub uh, is similar, but you kind of do that all through the GitHub interface. There might be clone line options. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on all of that. Probably are, I should say. Uh, and it, it allows for a much wider range of stuff rather than fitting it all within a YAML. Uh, the whole workflows folder, this is just an example of running tests that I've got up. Um, and yeah, it's kind of asking for a considerable lot of detail and you can name which sections it's going through. Uh, I think there's a whole lot more that can happen with that. Uh, so these are both uh, very useful. There's a whole bunch of other competition out there. Uh, might be worth checking out too, but generally continuous integration is really helpful. So uh, both of them are worth uh, considering and employing in how you're getting a project out. So um, documentation is really, really helpful. I sometimes use it to kind of think out what I really actually want to do and then write it down in code form. And it certainly makes it much easier for people to understand your project to make use of it. Um, I'm just focusing on read the docs and Sphinx. There's, there are others. Um, continuous integration then just very kind of easily feeds into read the docs because you can, of course, just use your GitHub login to create a login on read the docs and it'll automatically have an option to then just pull in a repository that you've got and provided you've got basic configuration like one of these cookie cutter templates it'll just set up uh creating the documentation for you um you can have a whole bunch of uh you know configuration options uh like math jacks etc they're lovely they're really useful uh i wish i could cover more about this i just don't have enough time so Push it to PyPy, finally. Uh, so basic thing of registering for a website, like many, uh, you'll need to register a key, both for the test and for normal PyPy. Um, the, the key token uh, has a scope. So if it's for test, it just covers everything all, either way. But if it's for the main kind of PyPy, then you can have the scope specific to a package. Um, save those keys somewhere safe. Uh, again, you can't include them directly in the repository, but we'll get to that. Package management, uh, password management can be really helpful. Um, so it's helpful kind of looking through some of this before you go all in, but and there are some other tools that can help you do that. Um, I'm going to focus on Travis for this because it's what I use. Um, so I had some issues. Uh, there was this whole transition when uh, Travis kind of changed hands. Uh, and that's one reason I've used GitLab a lot more. Um, so uh, once I had to kind of rearrange my configuration, this little command line tool, I just, I couldn't get it work. Uh, the username and password, I still don't know how to reconstruct that and my attempts to find out did not work. Uh, so again, there was this kind of acquisition, a lot of people kind of changed jobs. Um, but uh, the way you can do this is you set up a GitHub token uh, with the following privileges. Uh, there's a link to which hopefully we'll keep that up to date. Um, and with that token, you can get that sorted. Uh, then you can deploy uh, with that kind of line and the, note the deploy.password because that's basically taking advantage of that bit of what's provided in the cookie cutter package, it then fills in the password secure with the new encrypted key, which shouldn't have the PyPy prefix like the key. And that should be what you need. Um, but as I've tried to show in that configuration file, we're just looking at the test.pypy, not the direct pypy. Um, and what I've actually done since then, uh, since I first started doing this is just shift to keys that I register within Travis, quite similar to the options within GitHub, I think also GitLab. Um, so you can just define environmental variables, but make sure they've got underscores rather than hyphens. That was a hilarious uh, issue, it took me a while to sort. So now I can just put that password there uh, and then it's not you know, within the repository. Uh, so now I could actually test a, a deploy uh, with my bump to version, which we mentioned before, but wait, that's just for test.pypy, how we actually get it up on PyPy. Uh, so uh, there you could go for having different branches like staging production, uh, but I've decided to go with this sort of conditional deployment. So uh i sort of deploy in order so if it manages to pass test.pypy then i go for main.pypy uh again if you've been messing around with putting passwords and authentication keys and stuff it might be worth going through that repo cleaner i mentioned earlier so assuming you get all that up and you're happy with it you can then do that bump command 
the uh, parameter, again, sorry, I just don't have enough time to go through all this, is indicating what kind of version jump it's going to be. Uh, so it could be major or minor or patch, those bits of the number. So this is a patch that so would be going from 0 0.1 to 0.1 from 0 0.1.0. Um, this adds a git tag at that number. Uh, and then uh, with that, you push all of those changes first, and then you push including the tags to GitHub, and that should run the deploy. Uh, so it'll try to deploy to test, then it'll try to uh, deploy on PyPy, and then hopefully you'll have a package up um, and you'll get a copious bunch of logs from Travis if it doesn't. Um, again, whether it's helpful to have different branches for managing that more, you know, Sophisticated, I like adding a whole bunch of other stuff that's not included in this, but some of the other cookie cutters like pre-commit. Uh, these are some lovely libraries. I like black, isort, flake eight, uh, and mypy. Uh, you can also, if you're finding this whole thing too difficult, you can have a local .py, pypi rc uh, with your authentication um, as a backup. Uh, but that doesn't easily kind of continuously integrate, blah, 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 blah. So uh, it's hard to set up and hard to fix, at least for me. Uh, I found the safety of test.pypy really helpful. Uh, and after kind of wrangling around, my Travis seems to work fine. It might switch to GitHub Actions in the future or one of the many others. Uh, something for me to consider. So not quite done yet, sorry. Academia is still to come. So academia and software development uh, is a kind of interesting tangle. Um, citing actually, uh, you know, code specifically for research or in academic context is a kind of interesting and unfortunately hard problem. There's an interesting paper specifically about that. Um, and uh, I think it's even harder if you get outside the harder sciences. Uh, there's a project on citation file format. Um, here's some interesting posts about that. And Zenodo is one of the big firms in fall. So Zenodo uh, is a you know, citation option. It'll generate the DOI that you need uh, and it very easily connects to GitHub. Um, but at present, no other Git uh, repositories like it lab, unfortunately. It's under development as far as I can tell by the European Open Air Program, which is quite impressive and operated by CERN and can automatically pull from a GitHub repo. Um, so that's the easiest way. Create an account again, just like uh, read the docs to your GitHub account. Uh, you know, so they're just tied together. I guess that's probably an OAuth situation. Uh, go to that part of your profile. You should just see all of your GitHub uh, repositories listed there. Click the one you want. It'll be this sort of switch, drag, click situation, and it'll generate a new release, which you can then fill in a whole bunch of forms, talk about the details, and you've got a DOI, it's great. There is a much more customizable way uh, by actually directly editing a citation.sif file that you would need in your Git repository. And then that, then Zenodo would then copy from that. Uh, I got super confused uh, filling in. The CFF version is not your package version. It is the format version. Don't get that wrong. That was hilarious. Um, but this is what I'm currently looking at at the moment, uh, including my colleague. Uh, I think I need to customize this more, but it gives you a bit of an idea. Um, I think it's better if you can actually publish a paper as well. Um, certainly citations generally kind of increase readership, increase understanding, give you a bit more credit. Um, uh, and uh, they can also be a clear way of indicating exactly what kind of contributions individuals had. Um, there are details in Zenodo that aren't currently covered in the citations that CFF format like funding, but they're worth figuring, active development, worth getting involved. Also note to self, uh, I should do that and see if I can be contributing. So almost there, I should have had a seventh inning stretch or something if anyone gets that reference. So taking an academic project and polishing it for release is really hard, at least for me. Python cookie cutters uh, was essential. I don't know what I'd be doing without that. GitHub dominates the cookie cutter options, but I found uh, I found, but I think it's worth considering GitLab at least. PyTest is great, the only option for many cookie cutter templates. Uh, Read the docs is a difficult, is a default documentation system. It's really easy to get that going. Uh, there are some competitors, uh, but uh, yeah, it helps. 
Uh, Travis, I found hard with that whole migration thing, but it still seems to be working okay. I'm slightly worried I may run out of hours on that. That's another big question mark. GitHub Actions is uh, another option, and I'll probably go from one of the more extensive cookie cutters in the future. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, and here's some of my references and my dangling footnotes, which are probably too out of context to make any sense. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. So I see someone typing. So let's give him. Let's give them a minute to see if there is questions, okay. and uh, and then we can continue. Um, two things to mention while we wait for for questions is uh, one is um, this this track will be offline for for the next slot because we have a keynote, <clears throat> and then after the talk you can go and, and talk with Griff in the in the chat, right? So he's going to be available in the in the in the room in Matrix, and you can ask questions. So okay, I have a first question. Give me a second. Um, okay. Can you say a few words about the very last part? Um, I'm not sure what Paolo is meaning with that. Uh, Maybe what you were reference yeah. to Zotero. Uh, what I was going to cover is the last part is, is, is maybe double check uh, if that's what they're referring to, but um, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. But David is saying yes, right? So. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so Zotero uh, is oh, sorry, not Zotero, Zenodo. Oh man, sorry, that's one of those days. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> in an big. academic context, so Zotero, which is um, for uh, uh, managing citations, Zenodo is for uh, managing uh, code that is released uh, so that you can cite it. Um, and sorry, that's me today uh, is, is in that silly state, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so it's... It's, I think it's a quite nice uh, service. I, I don't know of a better one, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think GitHub is trying to, uh, has, has a potential project for managing that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sorry, I was, I was gonna then uh, try to log in and show you what uh, a demonstration of my release of uh, a library on that is. Um, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a very useful tool. Um, it then you can tag git uh, commits to that um, so that you know if your package is evolving over time, you know people are actually citing it at a particular state. Uh, it can be quite cumbersome to set up. And I think unfortunately it's very specific to GitHub at the moment. And I, I, I can't remember if for example, you're using GitLab for your project. I think they were a bit behind in enabling that, um, but I, I highly recommend it uh, if if you're hoping to make it citable. And that was that was my approach. Um, and cool. okay. uh, yeah. So last, Sorry. last question. No, it's okay. So can you recommend any resources related to PyPy project creation? Uh, yeah. So uh, cookie cutter, which is literally what I was about to demo here. If I had more time. I think it's an excellent option, uh, and it, uh, you know, this is an example of how it uh, will construct a template, uh, and uh, 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 yeah. So I'll go with PyTest for this. Um, click is quite a nice command line management option. Uh, and then what I've now generated is, uh, let's see, a new project. So you end up with this kind of folder hierarchy. Um, so that's including uh, a test folder, for example. Um, which conveniently has 
uh, just already a pre-constructed import for including tests of click uh, and you know basic version control uh, ex ex like expectations. What should be ignored? Uh, let's see, cat dot git ignore, for example. You know, it's a it's a very nice and it's kind of the the the, the version. Okay, so yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, let, let's just stop now because we are going to overrun uh, a lot. So I'm I want to say thank that. you very much. Thank you for being presenting here. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a nice day. Thank you.